Hi, um, I'm Max. Uh, I arrived here uh, from Berlin yesterday and I'm an audio design uh, graduate. I'm just finishing my bachelor thesis on uh, this is what I'm going to show you. Um, um, yeah, it's called contraction and it's, it has the, the essence of the certification of meta gestures and this is what I'm going to elaborate on and give a short demo. Um, like we already had some nice priming on all the user interface stuff that Jason was talking about. Also, um, also I thought that Alexandra's input on this topic was really interesting. Uh, and if we just, I googled music production here, you can probably not see that. Uh, you see we have an abundance of, of faders, knobs, and, and, um, and buttons everywhere in, in these user interfaces. <coughs> And like we already heard, these, these things are really, really good to give precise control. Um, and this, is, this makes sense from a user design perspective, because where all this derives from is from lab coat wearing people that are actual audio engineers that were working in a laboratory and were using all these, these tools. Um, and that's great, because they do what they need to, and they have their position in, in user interface design. And like Jason already elaborated, they're, they do what they have to do for user usability and accessibility to a lot of technology and to manipulate a, a lot of virtual or analog uh, equipment or systems around us. Um, a lot of these uh, ideas um, that came from these labs where we had uh, apertures, analog apertures, um, got remodeled and got remodeled in a virtual way. So you today you have. Uh, like graphical user interface that represent uh, compressors that are vintage or stuff like that. And so we went from, from an analog gear into the computer, into the virtual world, and through all these uh, controllers you can see here, a Google MIDI controller, uh, we're, we're bringing all this control out again out of the virtual environment and trying to, to get some tangible devices to, to actually manipulate all these, uh, these inputs that we have. Um, so that's, that's good and all. They all do what they need to do. And there's, there's a lot of, of choices you can make. So you can, you can just browse probably Google right here. Browse and browse and browse and look for the controller that you want. Or you can build your own like um, with, with an Arduino today. It's, it's possible. It's not that easy for people that are uh, not familiar with the syntax, but it's, it's doable. Um, so yeah, funny. We almost had the same, same slide in here. So all these buttons or knobs and faders and touch screens have, have a certain limitation that I thought was something that I didn't like that much. So a button is either on or off, so you press it, or a toggle switch is the same way, it's on or off, and uh, a knob goes from zero to value x, uh, I put the, the one here because uh, if you program, you usually, usually like to stay inside a, a range that you know and that you can control uh, with, with floats. Uh, a fader has the same a, a topography with a, a zero and a one, and a touchscreen is a little bit different because you have a two two coordinates that you can that you can use um, to manipulate more than one parameter, actually two. So what we see here is all um, uh, user interfaces that are elements or atoms that build up a user, user interface that um, that use um, one dimension or maybe two in a, when you when it comes to a touchscreen. Um, but if you, if you look at a musician, I googled musician here, um, and if you see one performing on stage with, with their instrument, I really like the, the internet relationship they're having with their instrument, which gives them some resonant haptic feedback on their body. Um, every minute little change they do with their fingers on, on, the, on the strings or on, on the piano uh, gives them a lot of expression. And we're trying to get stuff like that. There's, there's stuff like aftertouch or velocity, obviously, with the keyboard. But I think um, if it comes to digital music instruments, we don't have to take um, these ideas that we already had in classical instruments, but we can come up with totally new ideas, ways to express these multidimensional um, inputs that we can give the machine through our, our body or through uh, other uh, ways that we, that we can, uh, yeah, that we can manipulate. Um, so today, um, there's, an, there's a lot of stuff going on, like we said, there's a lot of noise where, when it comes to technology and I especially like the top left picture where uh, sensors are going to be maybe so abundant that it, there, you can just take a strip of it and this is just, I think we uh, posted on creative applications, this is none of my work, um, I, I forgot to, to put all the, key, uh, the copyrights there, probably, <laughs> but um, also the, the one on the bottom left is from a, a keynote from the guy that's doing the motion, he does some really, really interesting talks on what 
all, with all the money that's going into VR right now, that there's going to be sensors that are so small that you can just blow them away and they're going to be everywhere. So there's a lot of potential to track all the expressions that we're doing uh, in a virtual way and we gather data and hopefully uh, find a way to remap that to something that makes us express something in a way we couldn't do it before. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm just using one thing that's out there right now. This is the Maya, which uh, uh, is also worked a lot on here uh, at Integra Labs. Uh, this uh, device has eight EMG sensors that allow you to, um, to, uh, to register muscle, muscle contractions. So the electric potential that gets uh, created when, when you trigger a muscle, uh, a muscle uh, cell uh, gets uh, captured by the EMG, and there's also an IMU unit which gives you a lot of uh, control about uh, where the arm is in, in special relation, in a special relationship to the room or in absolute positions, and uh, you can have, extrapolate a lot of data. So that's a rich set of data that you have there, and I thought that's really cool. That was just the thing when I watched the videos. I was like, the applications that I saw were not so much. Inter not so interesting for me, also the gesture recognition wasn't so interesting for me because I think from all the, the interesting, really uh, intimate almost data that you can get from your body, um, it gets abstracted again if you use something like machine learning. It gets abstracted to a, a trigger or a toggle if it's not used in a smart way. Um, MLlib uh, is, is an awesome thing that I really like to use to, to explore a lot of these, these ideas and there's a lot of potential there. and. I hope this, this is going to come to, to a point where I think this is uh, really, really usable. And there we, there we come to the, the, the main issue of, of the main idea of my talk, uh, where all the stuff that also Jason was talking about is, is about product design and usability for the user. But if you pick up a violin, it's not going to play itself, and it's not meant to do that. It's meant to be explored by the musician, it's meant to be... Um, meant to be um, trained. So if you pick it up, it's not straight away going to make awesome sounds. It's something that you have to, to train on. And I'd love to have something like that for, for a digital musical instrument. So obviously you can take a controller and really start jamming and use the many different uh, dimen one-dimensional controllers to get a multi-dimensional feel to it, but it's still not as expressive as, re as really moving your body. And I like the talk that was just happening before by um, by Nuno because he also focused a little bit more on the performative aspect and I think that's one of the, the essential things that I also like to point out or work with. And so this is just a, a software structure, it's probably not that interesting. There's a, an SDK that comes with this thing, um, Sammy K, a uh, famous hacker, uh, made an OSC uh, wrapper for this and I modified that a little bit to my uh, users. And from there, you can, as soon as you have OSC, you can put it everywhere, it's like, cool, you can use MLlib, you can map it, you can use it, and that, that's great. Um, and go to Mail Live, maybe from there. Um, and yeah, this is just, I just want to reference uh, the local work here from um, Mr. Di Donato. Um, he did a lot of experiments with Mayo uh, concerning the, the MLlib, the, cap the capability of machine learning with this device. And the work I did just goes in a, bit, a little bit of a different direction. Um, but one of the key, um, one of the three major um, ways of doing machine learning um, is um, it, there's this. One of them is reinforcement. I don't want to go too deep into this because I don't have that much time. Uh, but if you have um, this this uh, sort of flowchart diagram right here, you have an agent that is in, in most cases a computer, which performs an action, and there's like a virtual environment that they set up to give this agent for a, a reward for the task if it's done in, in a way that they think it, it's, it's okay and it, it changes its state by that. So it's almost like conditioning the computer and they have a lot of these going on. And funny enough, I think if you, if you replace the computer with ourselves, so you put us in that position, there's a great potential of getting um, a lot of data today with all these interesting devices we have out there and all these sensors and tracking capabilities and using them to create some sound and give the, the user some, some feedback about that. And that's actually used in, in a lot of medical practices, or not a lot, but it's, it's, it's starting to get there that there's people that have tics or something and they have an EEG on 
and by hearing certain patterns or by the way the way the data gets abstracted to them and gets fed back to them, they can control certain aspects of what's going to happen and um, maybe people with locked in syndrome can, can start to communicate again with, with other people. Um, so you have this, this closed loop of and this intimate relation with your own body in a certain sense just by measuring stuff, extrapolating it into and uh, abstracting it into sound and hearing it again and then this is, this is just a closed circle. It's really it's much fun to wear it yourself and I'm really open to have everybody try this out later on. Um, there's all, obviously a lot of work of, uh, like this done in the, in the art field also and I think the art field is a really nice um, point, or like a nice area to explore some of these ideas. Uh, Alain Lussier did something where he controlled valve controlled instruments uh, by a headband that was doing EG back in 1965 and Atao Tanaka, from, at, which is resident at, at still at, no, professor, probably, okay. uh, at, at, at Goldsmith University, he does some really interesting work with sensors and the sensor band. And pretty recently, Mokret Vunaruma did, also did some nice work um, where he uses uh, some sensor on his arm, the X sense, and also gives a, a big a, a point on the, on the affordance of, of doing all these things because, yeah, he's, he's dragging some stones here and you really hear the muscles contracting. And yeah, there's, so there's this aspect of, of the, the affordance to, to get what you want with the sound. And what I'm building. Uh, this is the, the prototype I have on here, is uh, using the ICST Amisonics toolkit that is uh, released in Switzerland, I think, from the ZHDK, I referenced it here. Uh, and connected that with MLLib to, to give some, some, some ideas on, or to, to give the, the haptic feedback for grasp recognition and stuff like that. And I used the sound synthesis, which I'm going to demonstrate uh, after this slide. Uh, and this would be would enable one to extrapolate the eight dots that you have around your arm right here into space and move it. So all the, the movement of my arm is by one way uh, triggering or changing the position of all these individual dots. And on the other hand, um, you can you can use um, the the contraction like the, the the sound synthesis that I created to manipulate the sound too. Of, of each individual spot that you can position. And this is just for, for arts um, it, or for fun. It's, it's not really meant to be a, a product, so it's not obviously not really usable or it doesn't go through a user oriented design uh, process. It, it's all about a, a more expressive uh, tool that you can, can use to just have fun with or do performances or enhance dance performances. Or maybe what we're looking into is um, getting this into a medical perspective to, to help people that um, have uh, problems with coordination and stuff like that to, to give them some, some feedback about what, where their arms are and what they're doing. Um, so I think that's my last slide, yes. So yeah, this is just a, a shout out to my school and my professor. And from here we're going to go to Max first, I think. That's the, that's the thing. Oh, Max is here. Okay, so <coughs> just to open the recent patch. Okay, I didn't know that the screen's going to be this small, but <laughs> I'll try what we can do here. So yeah, this is just the, the OEC patch, which already it just illustrates that there's some data getting sent, and. If I were to, nope, to believe me, that's always the case. If I, oh, I know why. Okay. Maybe I'll have to postpone this demonstration because I have to go to live first. Yeah, that's why. Okay, so always see always accept only one uh, party to a port. I'm sorry. <laughs> so um, this is, I think, the, the beta of live, so I'll have to minimize that in a second. Um, but. From here, yeah, you should be able to hear something. And I'll give you a short demonstration of how this uh, sounds.
synthesis that I built in Max. This is just an implementation of some filtering and stuff on this because it would be really noisy otherwise. Um, you can see the data coming in here and I just have some switches to, to flip the, the scale. Um, yeah, and I, I really like this idea of, of having um, maybe it's a physical modeling environment or something that is so closely connected to, to, your, to your neurons maybe uh, if you can, there's some people that use this with two of these to control prosthesis, and I really like the idea to go even further with user experience or use it with the user interface to bring it inside your body to a certain extent. Because if we're in the future going to have some sort of um, devices that are maybe even implanted inside our brains or whatever, will we have to be able to have a mental capacity to actually know what this is doing and how to control it? Because otherwise we're going to be enslaved by it. <laughs> It's just a dystopian idea, but I think if we look positively or think positively about all the technology that's coming out, uh, I think there's a big potential to, to use this uh, in the future for really um, expressive instruments and really um, new ways to even figure out what, how bodies function and what, what signals are going to be sent. Uh, so if you have any questions, and the other demo with a surround, I'll, I can show that later because now I, I messed that up, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 